This morning, my message is taken from 2 Samuel. Cost of leaving a legacy. There's some people who think legacies were born. That's all right if you think that. But I believe that legacies can be pursued. If God lays it on your heart to do something, step out. Be bold and brave. And let the Lord carry you to that destiny. Because he's able. He'll never give us more than we can handle. He's a God of love. And love never abuses or misuses. Love endures all things. There are several people who have been strongly impressed to do certain things. And they immediately disqualify themselves by saying, I don't think I'm qualified. God qualifies us. And sometimes we have to work at qualifying ourselves. In the proverb it says, the preparation of the heart is of God. So we sometimes have to prepare our hearts. And sometimes we do that by reading God's word. Sometimes we do that by spending time in prayer. Sometimes we do that by taking a course that others have prepared that can help us to prepare our hearts but God speaks from our hearts if our hearts are prepared so father this morning I ask that you'll speak from my heart what I have prepared and let the people hear what you have to say in Jesus name amen Now, all too often, people just want what others have. They want what you have or what somebody else have. And they, they feel, well, you have it, give me some. You have enough. Share with me. But I believe that God can take us beyond what others have. You see, when we look at what others have, Envy comes in. I remember many years ago when Sister Moore was still alive, she says, never envy what others have. You don't know how they came by it. So we don't allow envy, but there is a cost to leaving a legacy. It's not a cost of money. But it certainly would be a cost of time and lifestyle. Godliness. Back to Sister Moore. Her legacy cannot be erased. I just shared it with you. Don't envy people. And yet she was not a lady of much means. But she always saw herself of having sufficient. So there was contentment. And these are qualities that we need to recognize as we approach God, not greed, not envy and covetousness, but contentment and pursuit. Samuel the prophet followed King David's life and he wrote a record of it this morning. As he's coming to the end of the record, he writes of some of the achievements Today's story is about three men who served King David. So King David's legacy incorporated three men that I want to talk about. There are many other things in his legacy. One of them we just read, my wife and I read the devotion yesterday of how King Saul died on Mount Gilboa. And King Saul was pursuing David, who was anointed king by the prophet Samuel, 
called on by God to do it. He obeyed God. He anointed the king. And Saul was trying to kill David before he died so he could leave the throne for his own son. Whereas his son was in agreement with David being the king. Saul couldn't care less. He had an ambition to do what he thought was best. That's not going to leave a legacy. And when David and, sorry, when Saul and his son died on Mount Gilboa, David wrote the song of the bow. Here is a legacy that David left. He said, nothing will grow on Mount Gilboa because Saul and his son died there, Jonathan. And to this day, nothing grows on the Mount Gilboa. If you go to Israel, you'll see, and you'll ask the question, but there's nothing wrong with the place. Why doesn't anything grow? God honored King David's curse on that place because Saul, his persecutor, died there. Anyway, that's too far gone. I'm getting off track. Let's get back home. And here is, out of David's legacy, three men whom, whom were also left a legacy. I want to share with you about them this morning. I'll read the text for a minute. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshab, Bashibah, Bashib, Bashihabeth, the Taconite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino. Nice name. Adino the Hittite. Because he had killed 800 men at one time. 800 men at one time. And after him, was Eliezer, the son of Dodo. Nice name, eh? The Aholite, the Ahohite. One of the three mighty men with David when they defied, def, def, defied the Philistines who were gathering there for battle. And the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines till his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. We'll talk about these things. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. No. I mean, I can't begin to imagine what that was like. You did the battle, you fought the battle, you conquered the enemy, and these people who ran away and should have really supported you, ran and hide, and now they come out to reap the harvest. I think if that happened in church life, many of us will say, shame on you guys. But that's not how it works. Because the one who did the task knew that he was called by God. He did it unselfishly, and that's a lesson for us, because far too often we call to do things for God, and because we didn't get the support of others, and then the others start to enjoy the benefits, so you know what? I done. So the lesson tonight, this morning, should open our eyes to some new things. And after him was Shama. That's another lovely name. The son of Agi. We should make notes of some of these names for the new children coming up. The Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together in a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils or peas. 
So the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field and defended it and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. I'm going to talk about another legacy of these men, but let's deal with these one at a time because I think there are rich lessons that we could learn. Adino, in verse 8, he killed 800 men. I want to ask the question this morning, is this a fantasy that we're reading or is this a factual, historic event? Hebrew history is rich of things that God permitted people on this earth to do. And we say, yeah, but that's Old Testament. That was when God was with the people. Where is God today? The people were confined to some laws that God had given them, and they couldn't keep the laws. We can't keep the laws. But God brought about grace. He came to the place where the Messiah, the Holy One, Holy means separate, separated to God alone. Sinless one means that he obeyed God fully. When we disobey God, that's sin. And he came and gave his life. But in giving his life, he first took all the sins of the world upon himself. So we who were full of sin and born with a sinful nature was free from sin. And many people don't want to even bother to accept that. It's too, it's, it's too simple. They want something a little more mind-boggling, something with some highfalutin dimension of faith and foam and fluff. But God's facts are simple. Jesus even said while he was walking the earth, I thank you, Father, that you made it for the simple. And some educated people cannot grasp the simplicity of the gospel. And some simple people think it's still too simple. They want to learn something more complicated and sophisticated. So the question comes back to this. If this man in that day could take a sword... and killed 800 of the enemy. What lesson can we really learn from this? First of all, he did not see the enemy as a joking matter. He saw the enemy as who they were. And the only way to deal with the enemy is to destroy him. We, today, we have an enemy. And you know what we choose to do with the enemy? We choose to negotiate with him. And the enemy is all the fallen angels and the demon spirits that Satan has as his followers trying to overthrow God. And sometimes we think that they're on the winning side because there seem to be more people going the way to hell, to judgment, going away from God rather than towards God. We see it as more interesting and more enjoyable and entertaining to pursue the way that leads to destruction. Why? Because our intellect and our humanness wants to pursue pleasure. And we allow these five senses to control us so feelings and sounds and smells and what we see 
and what we hear, or what we prefer. We don't see God, but we know He exists. Because we take a moment and we look around us and we say it's impossible for men to have planted all this greenery and all these trees and to incubate all these birds and all the, and the list goes on and the, the little lizards and the, all, all of creation speaks of God. Only a God could have done it. Since I was a boy, we catch in jacks. And just a couple of days ago, I was on the carinage and they were selling jacks from a boat still. How come they didn't catch it all? Oh, it's a mighty sea. Yes, it is. But I believe there's a mighty God who supplies all our needs. He said, well, if I want something, you know what? I go to food fair or real value or the little shop on the corner and I could get what I want. Hello? Those are just stocks of what God has provided. This black earth that we wash off our hand and we want to make sure it doesn't dirty our clothes is where the food comes from. And how amazing this God is that he allows us, allows us to recycle the things that we don't want to touch with our hands like manure. You have a composter and you put all the fruit skins and all the rest in it and you compost it and there's an odor that, whoo, that smells terrible. But then you put it in the soil and you add some water to it and the plants thrive on it. And then we eat the fruit from the plants. Or we dig up the roots and we eat them. Or we sell them so they could put them in the grocery store that others could get to eat them. If we cannot see the wonderment of God providing for us, if we cannot see nature around us, the stars at night, the sun in the day, the wind that blows, the rain that falls, if we can't see these things and say, there must be a God who sustains this, we would be less than ignorant. This man saw the enemy. He was attacking God's people. And he made his stand when everybody else was running. And he brought the enemy down because the power of Almighty God was at his disposal. He was doing the work of God for the cause of God. We need a few good men to stand up and face off with the enemy that they would stop destroying our children The child abuse would stop. The battering women would stop. Dishonesty would be exposed. Loyalty will be restored. Truth will rise up. And men and women will feel the comfort of God because the comforter has come and he is the spirit of truth that teaches us the way, the truth and the life so we could live differently. But there has to be the one who's going to stand against the enemy and who would that one be? God is calling constantly, let us stand against the enemy but you say, you know what I mean? If they want to go and kill themselves, let it go. If they want to sell rum, destroying homes and lives, men's livers are being psoriasis, psoriasis setting in, destroying the family. All the money gone before you come home because you got drunk and you share it with his friends. Everybody take a drink and when we come home, you have nothing for food and we had to look after the children and make it. Who's going to stand against this enemy, this evil? That's a question we need to consider. Is God calling us 
any one of us to make that stand. So let's read the other one. Eliezer, the son of Dodo, 9 and 10. One of the three mighty men of David, when they defy the Philistines, who were gathered for battle, and the men of Israel retreated. The supporters are not with you. But this man made his stand in a patch of peas. Some of us will say it's not worth it. We could get peas anywhere. This is not the only place peas growing. Why are you fighting so hard to keep it? But you see, peas represents the simple things of life. In their culture, the peas was, even now, Jewish people eat a lot of lentils. It was one of the staples that gave their life support, feed on. But it was just a peas patch. They had to put other things with the lentils to make a full meal. And sometimes we miss the little things because we say, well, we, no, whatever, that, that's just a small thing, you know? I mean, the way they dress and come up on the platform, that's just a small, the way they walk in tongue with this thing, no, that's just a small thing, you know? Wearing two sizes too small and all that kind of thing. Just a small thing. Just a small, uh, and it becomes a small thing until the small thing becomes big things. So we don't only stand against the 800 people. We don't only stand against the big issues, but we have to consider the smaller issues. Carnival is not our culture. I'm not popular for saying it, because too many people love the carnival. But it is not our culture. It's a demonic celebration that was brought about by a religious organization. We adapted it and nurtured it into something that's a money-making institution, but there are better ways to make money. Has anybody ever took a, a tally on the amount of births that take place nine months after carnival? If we took the decadal birth rate and we looked at what's the normal birth rate for a two-day period and then we look nine months after carnival, we'll see that it's multiplied about five times or more. Why? You could figure it out as adults. You don't have to ask the question. And yet we're willing to say, well, you know, it's carnival, let them do their thing. I am saying there's a time for us to make a stand. I remember when we used to talk about queers, but now we talk about, I forget the word I want to look for, but it's, it should have been a happy word, but it's turned into a gaze. When people are happy and they're gay, you love it. But how come we took the word queer and turned it into gay? Just another word for being happy. And it's misery. You're wired differently, they say. I didn't know people were wired. I know we have veins in our bodies and we have intellects and we have senses and we have desires. But if we nurture those desires towards the proper lifestyle, there is no way that anybody could convince me that what God says is wrong can become right. And so we play with it until it becomes what they call a reality in some societies. I'm watching a, natural television, a national television program 
called Judge Judy. I find it kind of relaxing and a little bit of laughs. She's very funny, but I wouldn't advise you to watch it unless you like television. And here is a man standing and he's saying, he's, a man is standing and he's saying, my husband was not home at the time. He was in, <laughs> I think I've gone too far. Let's go back to the question of Dodo. He's stuck to fight for a peace patch. And let me tell you, the Bible tells us he became weary. And we become weary when we fight for the little issues. We become tired and worn because it seems like nobody else cares. And they're pointing fingers at you and wondering, why are you going on like this? Why don't you just give it up? And his hand stuck to the sword. You had to take your fingers and peel them off. And that happens when you hold on to something too long. Somebody holding on for life and they can't let go. When they finally get them, they have to peel the fingers off because the muscles have contracted and it can't let go on its own. That's the kind of determination that this man did show Dodo to fight for a peace patch, the little issue in town, not letting you have it, not letting you destroy it. I put value on it because it sustains life. Maybe I don't have to eat any of it, but somebody else could live because I stood up and fought for it. What are the issues that are we fighting for as God's people? He rose and attacked the Philistines until his hands stuck in the sword and brought a great victory that day. And the people returned. Sometimes we need a frontline fighter. Not because the people are not with you, you give up. Many, and I speak about my calling, many people in ministry have given up because they became tired and they didn't seem to feel like they had any support with them. They feel like a failure because they didn't make it. But sometimes we give up just on the brink of a miracle. There's a little song that says, don't give up on the brink of a miracle. Just remember that you're not alone. Don't give up on the brink of a miracle. Just remember that God is on his throne. Sometimes we give up just too quickly. Yes, you're tired, but don't quit. So Winston Churchill was asked to speak to his fraternity in England where he went to school and graduated as, from college. And at their graduation, he was a keynote speaker. And everybody had their say on whatever they did. And then they called Sir Winston to the platform in his big, drapey robe, chest, sticking out as far as his tummy, or tummy sticking out, that'll be on his chest, whatever. Cigar smoker. And he came to the podium and he said, it was an all boys grammar school set setting. He says, gentlemen, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't ever ever, ever give up. And he went back and sat down. He demonstrated it in Second World War when they had to change pilots and fuel up the planes and keep them moving to bomb Germany and they won the war. There's a principle here for us when we call to face off with the enemy. He might beat upon you soundly, but don't give up. Battle is not won by feeble folk, but men and women who could endure to the end. And sometimes when we could stand no longer, we can bow the knee and continue the battle until we reach 
the victory. Shama, the son of Agi, he was the one that defended the peach, peace patch. And I already preached all I wanted to preach about him because we see the little issues and we wave them by. We say, well, that's not too bad. You know, we don't touch that. That's only going to create confusion. So let's leave it alone. But somebody has to stand and protect the peace patch. God is looking for people like that who would pick up the cause. I thank God this morning that we have this institution with us. And I thank God for the people who stood up and saw a cause and worked with these people because many of them can't hear. And many of them will re receive the hearing eventually. But for now, these men and women, these ladies, where are the men? I don't know. Maybe they're out having a drink still. The defenders of the peach patch, there's nothing too small. There's nothing too small to take back from the enemy. Fight for it. It's worth it. That's why we have a little academy downstairs. I remember one time it came right to the edge of closure. But one lady stood up and she moved in. And we were able to keep it, keep it alive. And then another lady came and joined in. And now it's blossoming again because we see the need to take children at a young age before the poison that the government public school system perpetuates. Before that poison hits them, we prepare them so they have a sound foundation. Who it was that said, give me the children and in seven years I'll give you a different nation? We don't like to talk about him because the nation had to be destroyed. Fascism. His name was Adolf Hitler. He says, give me the children, and in seven years, I'll give you a new Germany. But the Germany we saw was something that was repulsive, bigoted mindsets. We say, give us the children, and we'll teach them about Jesus and the love of God that cannot fail. Let's put them on the right path. What is it that God asks you to look after? Where is your peace patch? I'm going to read verses 13 to 17. Then three of the 30 chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave Adalom. And the troop of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephima. Rephahim. David was in the stronghold and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with a longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well at the gates of Bethlehem. well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three, the three that we just read about, mighty men, broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he, David, would not drink it, Poured it out. Oh God. Help me this morning. As a drink offering to the Lord. You know, we saw what these three men did before. But you think they just look and scheme and find and hide in the bush until they get through on the other side. No, 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 no. They fought their way through the enemy. No enemy could stop me because I am in God's army. I am going through. They heard the cry 
of their leader. They heard the passion in his voice and a deep desire and they decided to stand up and make it happen for him. And here is, here is the principle of leadership. David didn't lavish it on himself. He worshipped God with it. Because he valued his people more than the product. He worshipped God with it. You know, what is the key to these men leaving legacy as David's mighty men? One word, tenacity. Tenacity. Throughout the Bible, we see a call for enduring. And we forget it. But there's a level of endurance called tenacity where you stick to it. Yes, that's what the dictionary tells me. You stick to it. You refuse to let it go because of the call on your life and the cause of Christ to accomplish what he called you to do. I give you three modern day, you say Old Testament? Well, here's some modern day one. William Carey, England, called to missionary work. His only supporter was a cobbler, a shoemaker, a man fixing shoes. And he went anyway to India. And behind him he left the English Baptist Missionary Society. What a legacy. Thousands still following his example. Then there was Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor lived on bread and apples. He didn't have the affordability because he was just a pharmacist, but he saw the need to become a doctor, a physician. And he continued to study so that he could go to China and sacrifice there for the cause of Christ because nobody seemed to care about the Chinese people except to abuse them. They would send them into caves uh, to, to, to put dynamite and if they got all blown up, they, they couldn't care less. They just scrape their old bodies out and they shove it aside and they keep going, send more in. They build the railroads in the United States of America. He does crimes, but he went to bring the message of the gospel to China. Today, we have Inland China Missions. Mary Slessor, Scottish Presbyterian woman. Ladies, you're doing a good work. We have a few of you here too, always willing and ready to pick up the challenge. She went to Nigeria. She first learned the language. I can't even pronounce it. E F I K E F language, a, a local dialect, so she could she could penetrate. She didn't want to go in the city. She went to the people, and she rescued the orphans and the twins and labored. Today we have Nigerians going all around the world. We have a few in our congregation. Nigerian churches all over. And you say, well, that's good. That's history too. What do we have that we could talk about? Have you ever heard of a man named Joseph Uriah Moore? 
I spoke about his wife, Sister Mo. He had very little. And he counted no loss to give a significant portion to build a church called Cali's Pentecostal Church. It's no accident that Reverend Thomas Welch is with us because he was the one that was able to look after that. A seed was planted. And then this land was an inheritance that was passed down since the days of Governor Sendell. Sendell Tunnel in town, 18 something. We call it Gateway Assembly. But without Joseph Uriah Moore, God might have had to raise up somebody else because there would no, be no, no, no seed to grow. What is your legacy? What can your legacy be? In closing this morning, sometimes our legacy is with us and we can't we can't recognize it because we've grown so accustomed to it, but it's sometimes just irritating us or sometimes just stimulating us. Tommy and his mom lived alone on a piece of land and there was a nice pond just within sight of the house. He was an abandoned son. Nobody knew where his father went left home and didn't come back. Just age 10, he turned to his mom and he said, Mom, it's so hot today. Mom, please, 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 can I just go in the pond for a little swim? And she said, okay, Tommy, but don't stay too long. And as he's dropping his clothes, as he's running across, by the time he gets to the pond, he's stark naked and he dives into the pond. And she's smiling as she looks at her son. And she's washing the ditches. And something catches her eye in the next end of the pond, a big splash. And she realizes that's an alligator. That's a big alligator. And she drops the dishes, gets on her foot, runs to the pond. Tommy, turn around, swim hard. Come, come, alligator. And he barely makes a show and she grabs his hands as the alligator grabs his foot. She refuses to let go of her little boy. It's all I have in life. Can I let go and let the alligator destroy him? No way! And the alligator's flipping around and she's changing her hands, but she's not letting go. And over there in the farmhouse, from the shrieks of a voice running to the lake, a man sees this desperate woman and looks further and sees a little boy in the water and he figures, you know what? I gotta go down there. So he grabs his shotgun and he puts a cartridge in it and goes down and just in time, he blows the head off that alligator and Tommy's saved. What a legacy for a mother. Many of us have boys and girls at the right age with an alligator grabbing at them to pull them into the stark, dirty waters of the world. And we say, well, it's just a little fun. Oh, he's just a little boy. Oh, he's just a little girl. Maybe, maybe you're not seeing the enemy in the back of it. But I think the responsibility of parenting could encompass this story here because every parent could leave a legacy. But you're going to have to see the enemy. An enemy must not be too big for you because God is with you. I'm going to have to fight for some causes Make some sacrifices. 
Maybe take them out of that school if it's bad and get a school that could help them. Or take them out of that, that, that play that they're in and bring them into a church where they could learn the ways and be matured in Christ. Maybe you might have to fight for the little things that doesn't seem to matter too much. But when it's all said and done, you can worship God. You can worship God and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for my children who worship you. And so you leave your legacy. Will you come and help me close the service this morning?